that NFL draft weekend was absolutely wild. On the first night of the NFL draft alone, we saw nine in-day trades, not counting all of the other massive trades that we saw percolate over the last couple of years, from the quarterback trades to the really ridiculous Jamal Adams trade that Seattle made. And let's just face it, those mock drafts that you've been working on for the past couple of months, or maybe even for the full last year, they're completely worthless, and you had to throw them out into the trash. And hey, that's okay, because we're here today to dig into the impact and the ramifications of the massive moves that we saw over the last couple of days. Now, there's so much to dig into that I want you to make sure that you're up to date with everything that we're digging into here at The Breakout. So if you're watching on YouTube, please make sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video for more content about the NFL and the ramifications of all of the awesome moves that are happening in the future. And if you're listening on podcast, remember to follow our podcast so that you can continue listening wherever you are. Now with that, let's go ahead and get started. Now I think that the first night there were a lot of different moves that were made uh, that really shocked the NFL world and they didn't even happen in the first 15 picks of the NFL draft. They actually happened in the middle of the round at picks 18 and 23 and they show me a trend about where the NFL is headed and honestly the 2022 season is going to be a great experiment into understanding what is the right methodology for an NFL team to follow moving in the future. Now, what exactly am I talking about? I'm talking about the trades of the star receivers, AJ Brown and Hollywood Brown from both Baltimore and Tennessee. Now, to recap the trades, Tennessee traded away wide receiver AJ Brown to the Philadelphia Eagles for the 18th overall pick and their third round pick. And at the same time, uh, Baltimore traded away a wide receiver Marquise Brown, Hollywood Brown, for the 23rd overall pick to the Arizona Cardinals. Now, why is this such a big deal? Well, I think we have to understand the purpose of these moves from all of the team's perspectives. So let's dig right into it. Now, Baltimore traded away wide receiver Hollywood Brown after he was coming off of a career year where he put up 91 receptions for over a thousand yards, six touchdowns, was far and away the best receiver on the Ravens roster, uh, except Mark Andrews, who was an absolute behemoth. But when you look at their wide receiving core, I mean, you have Mark Andrews, you have Rashad Bateman, who they drafted in the first round last year, uh, and then you have Hollywood Brown, who they drafted in 2019 with a first round pick. And what the Ravens were telling you was that we are not paying Hollywood Brown what these wide receivers are asking for, what Debo's asking for, what, what AJ Brown was asking for, what Terry McLaurin were at, was asking for, because, well, let's face it, the Ravens aren't a pass first offense. That's not to say Lamar's not a good passer. I'm not going down that route of talking. Uh, I don't believe in that nonsense. I think Lamar is a very, very good passer. But the Ravens offense is run-centric, right? It's around Lamar's running ability, and if J.K. Dobbins was healthy, around his, you know, explosive playmaking ability. And when you look at the run-centric offense, there's absolutely no reason to be paying Hollywood Brown 20 to $30 million when pretty much you need to be building out the rest of your team. Your line matters uh, and making sure that you keep Lamar and that you keep uh, Mark Andrews on your team, uh, you know, are, are, are higher precedence than keeping a receiver who, frankly, you know, yes, Hollywood stands, he had a really good year, but he's not in the same class as DK Metcalf. He's not in the same class as any of those receivers who were asking for that kind of money. And so they knew that very soon Hollywood would be asking for that money and they didn't want to pay it. When you look at the kind of deal that the Ravens got out of this, I mean, this is just prime business, right? So what they did was they drafted Hollywood Brown in the first round a couple of years ago. They got three starting productive years out of him, and then they traded him for literally the same draft capital that they used to acquire him. So that's like buying a car, right? And then driving it off the lot, using it for a couple of years, and then trading it back in for the same price that you used it for. That is fantastic business. And so from Baltimore's stand, uh, standpoint, there's absolutely no reason to not accept this trade. With the exception that Lamar Jackson, you know, after he was tweeting uh, on draft night, like, 
why are why are we doing this like makes no sense like can someone fill me in uh and, and the fact that the ravens with those picks didn't draft wide receivers it was a little confusing but i will say that from the business and roster construction standpoint the ravens did a fantastic job here now if you look at the opposite side of the deal why did Arizona make this move? Well, they just lost Christian Kirk, which again, Christian Kirk stands like he he's not a god, okay? Like, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but he was a field stretcher, right? And when you look at the, you know, the receiving core that they had, they had DeAndre Hopkins, who, you know, while he was healthy, they were really good. Once he got hurt and, and Kyler got hurt, that often started to drop off. Uh, you have AJ, uh, sorry, AJ Green, who, you know, he's not prime AJ Green, but for a wide receiver three, a really, really good receiver. And then you have Christian Kirk, who, you know, got paid a fat bag down there in Jacksonville, and they needed someone to replace him. And I don't think Rondell Moore was going to step up to be that wide receiver two field stretcher that you need him to be. Especially when you have a short quarterback like Kyler Murray, you need bigger bodied receivers. Which is why it's kind of confusing that when they traded for a wide receiver, they went for Hollywood Brown. You know, Hollywood is a fast field stretching receiver, but he's not as big as AJ Brown. And so when you look at that deal, it's kind of confusing for that draft capital uh, and, and for the price that they acquired Hollywood, why they wouldn't just have gone for AJ Brown. But nonetheless, there's a college chemistry, you know, equation here where Kyler and Hollywood played together in college when Kyler had that Heisman year where, uh, you know, ultimately there's chemistry and there's a, re a reputation, there's a relationship, there's a connection. And, you know, may maybe after all of the drama that we saw this offseason, the Arizona Cardinals really just wanted to give Kyler Murray a little bit of an olive branch, you know, get him some guys, even though they're not going to pay him right now, um, you know, just, just mend the fences for at least another year. And so from that standpoint, you know, I think Baltimore came out ahead on this deal, um, but it all pans out, you know, it, it, we'll have to see how it pans out because I, I think that this was a suboptimal move uh, from the standpoint of the relationship that Baltimore has with Lamar Jackson. Um, and this is a uh, subpar move from the Arizona Cardinals standpoint in terms of what they gave up and who they got with that draft capital. Now, on the flip side uh, of, of the other trade, right, where A.J. Brown was moved from Tennessee to Philadelphia, I mean, what was Tennessee trying to do? Well, Tennessee is saying, look, A.J. Brown is a star receiver that we have on our team, uh, and we don't want to pay him. We just don't want to pay him $100 million. Uh, and, and we saw that when he got traded to Philadelphia, he immediately signed a four-year $100 million deal with like 57 point something million dollars guaranteed. Um, that, that's a lot of money. And when you look at the scheme that, you know, the, the Titans run right now, um, I, I, I'm not really sure if you can really call it anything besides a, a Derrick Henry-centric offense where... Uh, Ryan Tannehill is a game manager just making sure that the office uh, offense facilitates the way that it should. Now, uh, what they ended up doing with that is, hey, we're going to trade A.J. Brown, and with the pick that we're getting back for him, we are going to try and replace him with pretty much the same type of talent we're betting uh, at a much cheaper price point. And with that pick, they tr they drafted uh, wide receiver Traylon Burks from Arkansas, who was my wide receiver one coming out in the 2022 class. When you look at what Tennessee is doing, I think it makes sense from a cap management perspective, from a roster construction perspective, but what really confuses me and what uh, I think we need to keep an eye out for is that they're making a bet. Their bet is that Traylon Burks, who like AJ Brown is a multi-positional type of player who can be deployed all across the field, out of the backfield, in the slot, out wide, used for screens, used for stretching the field, uh, across the middle, pretty much anywhere on the field you want to use AJ Brown. Uh, that's how Traylon Burks was used at Arkansas. We might be able to see the ascent of Traylon Burks into that kind of role for Tennessee. And flashback, this is exactly what Minnesota did a couple of years ago with Stefan Diggs. Their bet was, hey, we don't want to pay this guy $100 million. Instead, what we're going to do, we're going to trade him to Buffalo and we're going to draft Justin Jefferson and replace his production. And so far, that bet has paid off. But remember, it's a bet. 
And so that means that there's always a chance that that does not pan out. And so there is an inherent risk here. But in terms of the model that they're trying to follow, I think that this makes sense as a move for Tennessee. Now on the flip side, I actually like this deal a lot better for Philadelphia. And the reason is really, really simple. In 2022, you have one job, and that is to answer the question, is Jalen Hurts your quarterback? See, in 2020, we had the whole snafu with Carson Wentz, and we had a little bit of him, and we had a little bit of J Jalen Hurts, and it was just a, a massive headache. It was just like really, really confusing. Uh, it made no sense. Uh, it, it was just a headache. I didn't want to listen to it on first take or Undisputed or Colin Cowherd or what, PFF or whatever show that you watch. I didn't want to hear about Carson Wentz anymore. And in 2021, I think we saw that Jalen Hurts is a capable quarterback, right? He did guide the team to the playoffs. Granted, it was a first round exit and they lost to the Buccaneers and it wasn't a close game. He did in his first full year produce really, really well. And now what you're seeing with this move is Philadelphia saying, all right, look, we don't really draft wide receivers super well, but we want to give Jalen Hurts uh, the requisite tools to succeed if he's going to be our quarterback. So we saw the Philadelphia Eagles draft, uh, you know, J.J. Ortega Whiteside, who, who we thought was going to be, you know, the next coming and he's busted now he's transitioned over to tight end like you know uh, we can scratch him off as you know a potential wide receiver one they drafted jalen rager in 2020 again we thought he was going to be the you know a really really good receiver for them and he's done literally nothing like he gets the snaps and he doesn't produce on the field and then last year they drafted devonta smith who you know he he's performed admirably i mean for for those of you who have been following my takes for a little while uh devonta smith was never going to be my wide receiver one in 2021. That was always going to be Jamar Chase. But Devonta Smith did perform and, and he has produced for that team. But I think that we can conclude that Devonta Smith is not a wide receiver one. He is at the best case a 1B. And so when you bring in AJ Brown, what the, what the uh, Eagles are doing is they're saying, look, we admit that we don't really know what we're doing when we're drafting receivers. So we're going to cash out our picks, uh, that, our multitude of picks right now for a known asset in AJ Brown. We're going to get him. We have the cap space. We're going to pay him. We're going to give him $100 million. He's, he's a known commodity. And now our wide receiver core is pretty good, right? We got AJ Brown, we got Devonta Smith, and you know, whoever your wide receiver three is, whether that's Rager stepping up or going with Quez Watkins, or maybe you really like Greg Ward. Ultimately, that wide receiver three guy needs to be someone who Jalen Hurts can rely on. And, you know, considering whoever that wide receiver three was, was the wide receiver two really last year. Um, I think that this is an upgrade move for the Philly offense. And so what they're doing is they are saying in 2022, Jalen Hurts, you either take us to the promised land. No, it's not Super Bowl or bust, but, you know, you perform really, really well and show us that, like, you've taken that next step and that you're a franchise quarterback. Or in 2023, we, we've set ourselves up very nicely for another quarterback to come in, whether that's moving all of those picks up for, um, you know, one of the top QBs in 2023, or whether that's trading, uh, you know, those picks for a, a, a disgruntled quarterback or signing a, a veteran uh, quarterback uh, in, in that free agent market. Ultimately, they're setting themselves up for pretty much any direction that this team can go, but with the first situation being Jalen Hurts proving himself to be a franchise quarterback and then moving off if they, you know, don't, don't deem that to be uh, uh, the situation. So ultimately, what do all of these perspectives and all of these moves or, or these two moves specifically indicate to us? Well, I think it's showing us that Teams are either going all in on the wide receiver or they're 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 wiping their hands clean of the receivers, uh, you know, and, and moving forward with the cheap assets that they can get in the draft. And these are really a clash of two philosophies. One is saying, hey, wide receiver is the next coming of success in the NFL. Uh, if you don't have an elite wide receiver, if you don't have a Jamar Chase, if you don't have an AJ Brown, if you don't have a Tyree Kill, then your offense is stagnant. Then your offense is not going to achieve what it needs to. And the only way to succeed in the NFL is to have that star receiver. That's philosophy one. 
Philosophy two is that star receivers are coming out in bunches in the NFL drafts in recent years, in 2020, in 2021, and in 2022. So why would I pay a guy $100 million when I can just draft his replacement and he'll give me 80% of what he was giving me in year one, and I can just keep doing this year over year over year? I don't have to lock my capital up with a diva wide receiver. And I think this is really interesting because in the upcoming year, you're going to see which philosophy actually is the one that pays itself out. And it's going to be contextual. I, I, I listed out, um, you know, a, a bunch of teams that have uh, pretty much leaned into this wide receiver centric philosophy, right? So we know there's Miami who has, uh, you know, Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, and then Cedric Wilson, who they signed in the off season. You have Cincinnati who already have Chase, Higgins, and Boyd, who I would argue are the blueprint for this philosophy since we have a copycat league. And they saw that this blueprint, good quarterback and strong receiver core is what got the Bengals very, very far in the playoffs. You have Pittsburgh who have uh, Deontay Johnson, Chase Claypool, and they drafted uh, George Pickens. Uh, they also drafted Calvin Austin. Um, you know, they had Juju last year, but pretty much they, they have a conveyor belt of receivers that they can plug and play there. There's Arizona, who I talked about earlier, who has DeAndre Hopkins, Hollywood Brown, uh, AJ Green. You have Philadelphia with all of these receivers. And then, you know, another example would be Oakland, who traded for Devontae Adams. They have Hunter Renfro, and then they also have Darren Waller to stretch the field. So you already have a lot of blueprints of teams going with the three top heavy wide receivers or receiving threats in place uh, to, you know, give their quarterbacks the best chance to succeed. In a lot of these examples, there's one player who is, you know, grabbing a lot of the capital that that team has, whether it's Tyreek Hill or, uh, you know, DeAndre Hopkins or Demonte Adams or AJ Brown, or you have guys on cheap rookie deals like uh, Jamar Chase or uh, Deontay Johnson, who I believe hasn't signed a contract extension. All things said, I believe that this is the way that the NFL market is moving into the future. And I think that this is just the beginning of the trend where wide receivers are not only drafted high, but are also going to get paid exorbitant amounts of money by teams who are wide receiver needy. And so when it comes to like your favorite team or whether it comes to, you know, your, your uh, NFL uh, assets that you have on your fantasy teams, don't really bank on a wide receiver who is a star staying in that particular situation their whole career like we've seen so much. We don't expect to see Julio Jones or AJ Green stay in Cincinnati or in Atlanta for uh, 10 years at a time. Instead, I would expect to see the next coming of these receivers, uh, you know, spend their rookie contracts on the teams that they were drafted to and then being sent over to a team that's wide receiver needy. So now that I got all of that off of my chest, I am ready to talk to you about the teams that have intrigued me the most by their moves in the NFL draft. So why don't I go ahead and begin with my list of teams that have I that have either loved their moves, uh, I've been intrigued by their moves, uh, or I just am straight up confused by what the hell they're doing. So the first team that I want to talk about is the Atlanta Falcons. Now, last year with the fourth overall pick, they drafted Kyle Pitts. This year, with the 8th overall pick, they drafted wide receiver Drake London. They traded away Julio Jones last year for like a 2nd or 3rd round pick. Uh, and they traded away Matt Ryan for a 3rd. They got all of that cap hit off of their salary books. They drafted Desmond Ritter uh, in the 3rd round. And they drafted running back Tyler Algier uh, out of BYU uh, in the 5th round. So, in totality, what I see Atlanta's moves being is an indication of how they're planning on moving forward. So they moved off of their older aging assets, right? Granted, they didn't get a haul for them. They did get those massive salaries off their books and they did get assets in return. They've set their team up now so that they have Kyle Pitts right there as a, you know, de facto wide receiver one. You've got Drake London, who, if he pans out, is now a massive big-bodied threat that you have on the X uh, of your offense, right? You have your alpha wide receiver um, who, who's big body, who's who will be able to go up, um, and so defenses will be have will have to choose between um, you know covering Kyle Pitts uh, in the middle of the field. 
uh, and uh, covering Drake London uh, on the outside. And in 2023, when Calvin Ridley comes back, or if he comes back, uh, you know, big if, but if he does come back, now you've got like a behemoth, a three-headed behemoth, three-headed monster that defenses really have to pick and choose who they're going to cover. Now, what do you do about the quarterback? Well, <laughs> the fact of the matter is that they've got Marcus Mariota, who they picked up in free agency. Marcus Mariota isn't going to be a game-changing quarterback, but I definitely think that he will be someone who can teach uh, the players that are there uh, the nuances of a, a complicated NFL offense, right? He spent time in Tennessee, he spent time in Oakland, and, you know, he he's going to win them some games, but they're not by any means going to be, you know, I, I don't even think they're going to crack 500. Now, with the Desmond Ritter pick, you've really bought yourself some flexibility because we know that, you know, Desmond Ritter is, you know, he has a lower ceiling, uh, but he's more NFL ready than the rest of, uh, you know, the, the quarterbacks that were in the class with the exception of Kenny Pickett, right? And so when you look at what Desmond Ritter brings to the table, uh, he, you know, has the mobility, he has the ability to, you know, really mimic Mariota's game. And, you know, he's in a position where I don't really think there are any high expectations for him in that situation so if you you know have him in your system for a year and then you determine hey Desmond Ritter is a guy that we want to give the wheels give the keys of the uh, car to right he's there and he's available but more likely than not that team is not going to be in a successful position uh, to really be I would say in the top two-thirds of the league next year and that's totally fine Arthur Smith is still building out uh, you know a, a really interesting offense that's kind of in his own life and if things don't pan out, again, you're sitting there with the uh, you know chance to get uh, a CJ Stroud or a Bryce Young or whoever the hell else pops up next year um, across you know the the face of the uh, you know NFL draft landscape. And then finally, when you look at the running back situation, right? Uh, you had Cordero Patterson really pop, but he, he's like close to 30, if not a little bit more. Um, I, I, I don't really think that he's your long-term solution. Uh, can consider me bold in making that claim. And then you have Mike Davis, who again is really, really old, not your long-term solution, which means that Tyler Algier has the potential to be kind of your diamond in the rough, the same way that Antonio Gibson was drafted for Washington as a, you know, later round running back, or uh, Austin Eckler, who I believe he was undrafted. But again, like what we've been seeing in the NFL trends is that generally speaking, running backs are not really they don't have a high replacement cost so whoever you draft in the first round you can get 80 percent of that value uh in the third in the fourth and the fifth rounds sometimes even undrafted and so i think all things said the atlanta falcons have provided themselves a couple of chess pieces that they can tinker around with and see if if it really works and if not they haven't really harmed themselves in terms of going for the top tier quarterbacks in 2023 I was in absolute love with Baltimore's draft too, and I don't think I'm the first analyst that you've heard that from. They did not have to move up whatsoever to get their guys. They were able to land Kyle Hamilton, uh, you know, just sitting there in the middle of with their original uh, pick in the first round, and many people would consider him to be the best safety, and many times was considered a top three pick in this draft. So the fact that he slipped a little bit based off of his combine performance and whatnot, I I think is just really really good luck for the Ravens and this is exactly what they do he really feels like a stalwart uh you know decade-long safety in the NFL and lo and behold it fell to a team that historically drafts really well and then, you know, with their Hollywood Brown pick, where they got the 23rd overall pick, they moved back, got uh, Tyler Linderbaum, who, again, is the number one center in this draft class without having to move up whatsoever. I really, really like their draft in the first round in itself. But then on top of that, they were able to go and get two tight ends that I really, really like. So they were able to get Charlie Kolar, and they were able to get tight end Isaiah Likely in the late rounds. And for those of you who have been following my content, you know that Isaiah Likely uh, was my number one tight end uh, in this draft class, just a hair above Trey McBride, who went several rounds ahead. 
I think that the Baltimore Ravens have really set themselves up to lean into what has already worked for their offense, which, you know, when you look at what the offense could be structured to do, right, they've already got Mark Andrews there, but now you've got two more calibered uh, tight ends uh, who really could help you mend the structure of your offense to a two tight end set uh, as opposed to really relying on you know their their Miles Boykin and uh, Mark Andrews sets that they were running before um, and have provided a little bit of a shift when it comes to the offensive focal point because they didn't go for a wide receiver uh, or, or a high caliber wide receiver in this draft. No, instead they went for the guys who have uh, you know really high high potential if they are drafted and developed well. And I think that that's exactly what you have here. I think the last one that I want to point out is that they drafted Tyler Beatty, who was, again, uh, at one point, a top five running back for me uh, in this draft class. And you know, a lot of people are like, well, what do you do with the running back situation in Baltimore? Well, J.K. Dobbins is your number one. Uh, we're not going back to Tyson uh, Williams. Uh, Gus Williams was that satellite back that, you know, a lot of people thought was going to flourish. I think Tyler Beatty steps up and he's instantaneously the running back too by the end of camp um, for this team, uh, especially considering his pass catching ability um, and, and his ability to take over when J.K. Dobbins isn't on the field, which his return, you know, again, ACL injury. He's had a full year to return and recover from that. Um, the, the Ravens have done a really good job of getting the pieces necessary to augment what has already been working for their team, um, with the exception of a wide receiver one or two, uh, which really remains to be seen. Very quickly, I'd like to point out that I just hate what Jacksonville has done for the last two years outside of the Trevor Lawrence pick, which, you know, can't really screw that one up. Taking Trevor Lawrence 101 was like the last good pick that I feel like these Jaguars have made. Um, the fact that they were thinking about Kadarius Tony, yes, it was the Urban Meyer years. Uh, super weird. Uh, we all can agree now that Kadarius Tony was overvalued, overdrafted, uh, and, and you know, even if he might be a starting caliber receiver, he's nowhere close to a wide receiver one. I think that when you look at the fact that they drafted ETN, uh, when you had other wide receivers uh, available on the board, uh, you don't take running backs in the first round, and yet they took ETN, uh, who then instantaneously had a Liz Frank. The Liz Frank injury is one where like um, some, some medical reports that I was reading said that you, uh, at best case, see a player return to 80% of the level of explosiveness that they had pre-injury. So like you can kind of think that whatever uh, his ceiling was, ETN ceiling was, uh, that drops by 20% at the absolute best case. And I really didn't like ETN's best case to begin with. So, um, you know, that, that was last year. And then this year, you know, they go and they draft Trayvon Walker, which is 100% up Trent Balky's, uh, you know, uh, like, uh, repertoire, reputation, uh, you know, whatever. When he was the GM of the San Francisco 49ers, he consistently drafted the best athlete at the top of the board, right? So that's how you got guys like Alden Smith, who were freak athletes and really did perform, but chose those guys over, you know, the more technical or the more round out football players that they could have had at that same situation look you know fast forward to this draft and lo and behold they go for they go for Trevon Walker who again might be a good player but they went for him over Aiden Hutchinson because of his raw athletic score which many times on this show we've talked about having no correlation to success in the NFL raw athletic score really just tells me how athletic you are and we know that a majority of the guys who are playing in the NFL um, have a baseline level of athleticism. Now, if I have all of the, the technical skills necessary to be, you know, elite, right, and then I have the raw athletic score uh, and I have, you know, a strong athlete athleticism, then I think that that bodes really well for that player. But it means nothing without the context of being a good football player. And I think Aiden Hutchinson was, you know, the pick that I would have preferred they would have gone with, uh, but they didn't, right? And they went with Tavon, uh, Trevon Walker. And I think all things said, you know, it, I, I would say like when they traded up into the 27th pick and they drafted Devin Lloyd, I liked that pick. I liked Devin Lloyd as a player, um, but... You know, all things said, that team 
uh, has a lot of holes and the way that they've gone about patching up the very important holes on that team I think has been really terrible when it comes to filling out their offensive line when it comes to what they've done with the wide receiver core and giving Christian Kirk that god awful amount of money this offseason um, they, they still don't have a wide receiver one on that offense and they lost DJ Chark who you know was your pretend wide receiver one uh, all of last season right so when I really take all of these factors into account, I just need to put it out there that I don't like what the Jags are doing. I don't like what they're doing for Trevor Lawrence's development. And I have to say that if the Jaguars do start winning and do start performing well and Trevor Lawrence takes that next step, it's not due to the help of the offense. Uh, sorry, it's not... It's not due to the help of anything that that organization is doing for that quarterback. Now, I want to touch upon the Seattle Seahawks because, oh boy, is this organization super damn confusing. So we know that for years, uh, you know, their drafting background has been pretty trash, right? Taking Rashad Penny in the first round took him three-ish years in order for him to pop. Yes, fantasy owners, we get it. He won New Year League last year. It was a very, very small sample size. And I think when I look at what Seattle's draft was this year, it was good in relation to other years' drafts. Um, but I think it really sets up very interesting and it, and it signals uh, what Seattle's thinking moving forward. So they drafted Charles Cross, who's a very strong uh, offensive lineman. They drafted Kenneth Walker um, in the second round, who is a very, very strong uh, rushing talent who, again, we've had questions about his pass catching ability. Maybe it's there, maybe it's not. The thing that we know for certain about him is that he's going to kill it running the ball. They drafted Boye Mafe for the defensive end. Uh, they drafted a cornerback that I really like in Kobe Bryant out of Cincinnati in the fourth round. I think that's a it's a fantastic steal. They drafted Tariq Woolen, um, who again is a cornerback that I really like as well. And when you look at what this team is doing, you know, they haven't addressed the biggest question in the room, which is quarterback. Uh, out of all of the reports that I've read, Geno Smith is actually beating Drew Locke um, in, in the minds of the coaches uh, for that QB1 position. And so that really means, you know, even if it does end up going to Drew Locke, uh, I, you're not really dealing with the high ceiling quarterback there. So what Pete Carroll and John Schneider are doing is they're really rounding out many different components of the roster without paying attention or adding much to uh, the, the quarterback position. So that tells me one of two things. Either A, they're going to go trade for a veteran, which please, for the love of God, I do not want Baker Mayfield on the Seattle Seahawks. That is just like putting yourself in purgatory and then extending that forever. <laughs> Or they're saying, hey, we're going to continue building out our team, building out our roster. We don't anticipate us being a good winning team. Maybe we'll be competitive, but we won't be winning next year. But we'll have our picks. And then we're going to go for Bryce Young or CJ Stroud at the top of the draft next year. Now, Pete Carroll has uh, attested that this is not a rebuild. So maybe he really does believe that Drew Locke is the answer. Uh, hint, it's not the answer. But I think that if my intuition is correct... This signals to me that they're focused on building out the roster, getting all of the tools in place for a quarterback to come in and be successful hitting the ground running. And so I would really keep my eye out on what Seattle's moves are over the next year and what sort of trades they're making to indicate whether they're really leaning into that 2023 QB class. Because if they are, I think that would be really, really fantastic. I want to talk about the Chicago Bears. Now, these guys won a lot of points in my heart when they drafted Justin Fields last year with the 11th overall pick of the 2021 NFL Draft. I really wish he fell to the Pats. He didn't. Instead, they got Mac Jones. But I was like, great. The Bears are making the moves necessary to bring themselves out of their archaic defensive first mindset that that entire organization has embodied for pretty much its entire existence. And what have they done since then? They let go of Allen Robinson. They continue to believe that Darnell Mooney is your wide receiver one. And in the draft, without any first round picks, the first two draft picks that they make are defensive backs, right? Jaqu Jaquan Brisker out of Penn State, who's a safety, um, and uh, Kyler Gordon, who is a cornerback. And that just really shows me that they are putting too much 
responsibility and too much onus on Justin Fields' shoulder, um, and, and they're not managing their roster the way that they should be. I mean, we... I mean, we know that the number one responsibility for a team with a quarterback on a rookie deal that was drafted that high is to make sure that you put him in position to succeed and you put him in a position to tell you if he is your franchise quarterback. You have a five-year window where that guy is super duper cheap and then if he is that guy, he is going to cost you a mammoth amount. And if he's not that guy, you've just spent half a decade focused on a guy who is not giving you the answers that you need as a successful NFL franchise. But instead, what they're doing is they are not giving him the assets that he needs to be successful. No, instead they believe that Byron Pringle and Darnell Mooney are the guys that uh, will, you know, really help ele um, uh, elevate Justin Fields in a year two jump. And drafting Vellis Jones um, in, you know, one of the later rounds is what Justin Fields needs to succeed. No, instead what they need is more receivers and a stronger offensive line, and instead they go for a defensive head coach, and they don't augment the wide receiving core besides getting Byron Pringle and Vellis Jones. I mean, I'm pretty disappointed, but honestly, what do you expect? This is a poverty franchise type move, and the Bears just continue to get in their own way. I mean, if you look at their roster construction, the guys that they're paying the most in 2022 are linebacker Robert Quinn, safety Eddie Jackson, center Cody Whitehair, linebacker Roquan Smith, running back Tariq Cohen, linebacker Danny Trevathan. I mean, the, the, the 101 of roster construction is A, you get the quarterback, B, you pay for his protection, left tackle, right tackle, and then fourth, you get pass rushers to get the other guy's quarterback. And what you're seeing with the roster construction of this team is that, you know, one, two, three of their top one, two, three, four, five, six players. So half of their top six players that are getting paid are linebackers. One is a safety, one is a center, and one is a running back. This team composition is terrible. And I don't know what Ryan Poles or uh, Matt Eberflus are doing, but Consider me confused, consider me disgusted, consider me absolutely uh, abhorred by what this team is doing. And that's where I land today. All right, so thank you for listening to today's rant on the NFL draft and its implications all across the league. If you're looking for content about rookie mock drafts for Dynasty or for Best Ball or for any version of, uh, you know, player projection, player specific analysis, make sure to subscribe to the breakout below. If you're listening on podcast, make sure you follow the podcast so you don't miss our content. And of course, I'm Avi Gupta. You can find me on Twitter at Real Avi Gupta. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. Let's hit that music. Music.